Welcome to the Autonomous Vehicles Podcast. Today's guest is Ratha Basu, CEO at iMerit. In this episode, we discuss the data demands of AV companies, how iMerit helps them with complex edge cases, and the biggest challenges that still need to be addressed to further advance autonomous mobility in cities across the U.S. Let's dive in. Hi, Radha. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, great to be here. Just to get started, always love to learn a little bit about your background and and how you got interested in AVs. So um, I'm basically an engineer and have been in the um, technology industry for a few decades. Let's put it that way. Started off with a lot of uh, image processing and uh, that kind of work at Hewlett Packard. Was there for twenty years, including working in the U.S. in R and D, running European operations, and then had an opportunity to start uh, Hewlett Packard in India at a time when IT in India were not uh, really uh, hadn't taken off into uh, a multi uh, hundred billion dollar industry. And I'm originally from India and then uh, grew an organization at HP called Enterprise Solutions. So bringing technology solutions to the Fortune customer, like Fortune 200 clients. That became a $1.2 billion business. And then I decided to leave HP and start a software company, which uh, we took public on NASDAQ in 2000 at a very exciting time. It was like two weeks before the dot-com bus. So it was um, very exciting uh, times in terms of really proving ourselves at the time when a lot of technology companies were questioned. We did a secondary, you sold the company. And then I decided to uh, join my husband who was at Cisco and had decided to start a nonprofit looking at skilling young people. Uh, from uh, marginalized, low-income backgrounds into technology and data jobs. So the whole way I got into iMerit uh, was started iMerit about eight and a half years ago to create jobs in the data economy. And I feel really good about the bet we made that this will be a long-lasting career opportunity for young people. So I'll tell you a little bit about the workforce at, and the employee base at iMerit in a minute. And the fact that this would require expertise and skills and that would be in the data economy, which soon became the AI and the computer vision space. But even then, you know, five years ago, could not have anticipated as I was telling you before, the amazing ride of autonomous technologies and autonomous vehicle customers and where they have taken us. And I think of us as having a real window into all the innovation via data. So it's all about AI data, the highest quality data, just-in-time data, having the edge cases, and being able to do it in such a way that it takes products to markets faster. And this has proven and is proving to be a major factor in the evolution of the AI or the AV, the autonomous vehicle, or what I call autonomous technologies or autonomous mobility. So that's the history of um, iMerit. It's... um, As I said, it's about just over eight years old. Very fortunate to have done the seed funding. Uh, Came from uh, Piero Media, of a media network, uh, founder of eBay, and I did the seed funding. And we've done A and B rounds and uh, have been joined by um, stalwarts in the uh, tech industry, uh, the Dell Foundation Ventures, Kosla Ventures, and then latest by CDC. Um, I merit is about um, 4,500 people, primarily experts in computer vision and natural language processing, some speech to text, um, very much uh, a large uh, chunk of our business is in autonomous 
mobility and of robotic mobility autonomous vehicles. Um, you have a couple of interesting stats. 50%, 53% young women. Average age of the workforce is 24.3. So it's a very young, very much born digital, born mobile, sassy, um, always on the go um, employee base and keeps me on my toes. So that's kind of the background of iMerit and how we came to be where we are. That's amazing. And uh, really just so incredible to hear the the scale of the workforce and and also you know that uh, 53% women at that age mm-hmm. too is uh, is amazing um would love to to dive a little bit deeper into the 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 problems that i merit is helping these autonomous vehicle companies or as you would say autonomous technologies um solve for um could you share a little bit around you know what are the the data demands that they have and you know how are how are you helping them to solve those those problems so let me do it in in three steps so the the robotic mobility or autonomous mobility has the three parts right ground robots which is what we will talk about the most autonomous vehicles aerial robots geospatial drones, autonomous shuttles, et cetera, and now more and more home robots and looking at how these will come together to improve the general quality of life. I think that, first of all, AVAT companies invest heavily in capturing image, video, and LIDAR data. And this generates, we, we, we've spent a lot of time in the data science, which is generating millions of lines of code for being able to train the uh, to train the autonomous technologies, the data science of it, and that is what we spent. Uh, we have spent a lot of time being experts at is training algorithms and providing the data, the high quality data to label, to annotate. And as time has increased and they've been just, I mean, we looked at it recently and we've done close to a billion data annotations. It's, it's mind boggling, but you know, over that, I, I don't even know how much over, but it's about getting the right algorithms that can go into the autonomous vehicles, technologies, et cetera. As that has evolved, they have become more and more complex. And you know this better than anybody else because you have so many people who have come on this podcast with that information. We started with very basic bounding boxes, you know, polygons, uh, SEMSEC. There was a time three or four years ago where, uh, where Pixel level semantic segmentation was like the hard thing to do. Then panoptic, then 3D LIDAR, then 3D point cloud, multi-sensor fusion. These are all just technology names, but what it signifies is each step of the way, you're bringing together multiple technologies, aggregating them and using those, that multi-sensor fusion To be able to train machine algorithms requires a lot of expertise. So we've been very much in the space of annotations and labeling. So what we call label ops. As the pretty much radical digital transformation is starting to take place, and they are starting to, the first autonomous vehicles are going into we call them launch mode, then you start to very much look at mapping solutions. So map ops has become a very important part of our go-to-market because that's where our clients are going. So scaled, consistent, high quality, increasingly complex and nuanced. And the map op has two parts to it, right? You build maps because clearly you can't take Google Maps to figure out you know, what the, uh, the different aspects of mapping operations, sim collisions, and, and uh, to be able to do 
uh, lane-based uh, geo um, and bring in lots of different technologies, some really complex ones. And then looking at how, as launching goes into cities, onboarding each new city represents new situation and challenges. And I would say this is now in that last mile. I would say maybe we're still in the second last mile, but going into the last mile where launch vehicles are out there. And the big thing that's happening now is how do you respond in live mode, in real-time mode, in, or it, I would say the word dynamic, to changes in the mapping. So if there are public works stuff, or if there is a sports event going on and things like that, how do you respond? And it is that bringing together of the different technologies and the experts in the loop. I don't call us anymore humans in the loop. We're experts in the loop. Our whole, the way that we're bringing, helping to bring autonomous vehicles into the market, into launch mode, is being the experts in the edge cases and making sure we can proactively through label ops and map ops address this um, edge cases that we're going into. So that's the evolution of the market. It's a very exciting time, as you know, um, and in many different ways. And I would say one last thing. Besides the computer vision technologies I've talked about, the autonomous uh, vehicles, there's also stuff to do with, we do things like key point annotation, looking at driver distraction. And uh, we actually do one where we look at the, um, the flickering of eyelashes and from the camera and look at whether there's driver distraction, whether there's movement of the face, uh, speech to text, natural language processing, all of these are now coming into it. So I would say the next five years are big for autonomous technologies. And I'm excited, as you can tell. Yeah, it's amazing. And for just to make sure, you know, the, the picture is clear is when, when you're mentioning that these companies are providing you with data sets. So there is, as you mentioned, there's kind of a, a few primary data sets that these uh, vehicles are generating. The first camera, second LIDAR, third radar. Um, those are, let's call those the primary data sets. And then I'm sure there's, you know, a long tail of others. Uh, within those primary data sets, do they give you all of them and ask you to, to now label, oh, okay, this is... Um, a stop sign that we're seeing here, uh, or this is a, a dog that's running across the road. Can you share just a little bit around like what the, the actual mechanics of this look like? Like what type of information do they provide you? And then how does the iMerit team um, kind of label it, add the that, that, this, that expert touch, and then give it back to the company so that they can now use this more effectively? I think that's an excellent question. So the product lifecycle stage creates different demands. Demands of AV are dependent on where people are in the product lifecycle from beta to full deployment. It, there are demands for solving very complex on-road scenarios. I wish they were, um, you know, separately like LIDAR, radar, camera. It's when they all come together in this multi-sensor fusion that makes it really complex, also very that's where the accuracy comes. And so we start to want to have domain expertise. And so the, the kinds of examples is having the vehicle needs to have to deter read the road conditions to determine the proper path and decisions. So for example, you can have everything from simple things like street signs, but then construction people holding street signs, often in most inconsistent locations, uh, signs that flip out from the side of a school bus that's moving. So a lot of it today is about moving vehicles, right? And what's happening with that. And you can have, um, as I was saying, you could have false positive readings of the environment. A lo lot of work we do is about reflections. And you'll find this very interesting because we have a whole set of workflows on reflections 
of people walking and you're picking up the people, but you're also picking up their reflections and their reflections of cars in large windows in commercial buildings. It could be on certain days, it could be, I'm giving you just examples off the top of my head, garbage. It could be um, a sporting event and Halloween and people walking the streets in all types of costumes. We actually had one work for <laughs> during, and that's why I bring up Halloween, where people are dressed as animals. And so there was this whole thing about is this animals or are these people? And so there are some really, really interesting um, things that happen. Now you get more complex than, I was on a TechCrunch um, um, panel with the CIO of uh, Las Vegas. And it's one of the cities that uses, um, is at the forefront of autonomous technologies. And he was talking about the many events in Las Vegas. It's kind of the event capital, sporting events, and all kinds of things with crowds of people, creative costumes who don't follow standard road rules. So these are all, you start to look at subjective assess- assessments that take part that we have to annotate and be able to label and be able to do map ops around. So when you come into this, you will look at expertise level, geographic location. So we could do things like track labeling. So I'm giving you more um, track labeling may be actually easier. If you miss tracking one object, then that will be like a blind spot to the AB and may lead to an accident. You may look at size of a cuboid and precision. Um, missing an object, especially near to an AV, and tracking errors could be fatal for AV. And this can obstruct prediction tagging. We're starting to do a lot of prediction tagging. And so that's a data annotation task. Tagging a particular behavior of vehicles and pedestrian and actually using that to do predictive analysis, especially in video object tracking. So um, it's even things like, um, I remember, I look at a lot of the workflows, headlight pattern identification, changing colors, school zones, and uh, people uh, carrying beacons on school zones, which only happens at certain times. Um, And I I can give you more panoptic edge cases. Uh, This is an important one that gives, identifies the panoramic view of the AV and objects and patterns. Of course, there are the usual things of somebody opening their door, I say usual, there was a point in time where we thought that was a a complex use case. Um, And so dead end signs, we've come across that as well. Um, If we don't take the various classes and if they are incorrectly masked even, forget the classification, but incorrectly masked, that could also result in uh, collisions or even it doesn't have to be as you know, dramatic as a collision or as serious, it could be in a lot of um, misguided, autonomous, um, uh, what should I say, deployment of vehicles. Does that give you an idea of the kinds of things? So there would be across mapping, real-time data feedback, traffic pattern analysis, complex road transitions like massive freeways that cross over you know, those guys, Washington, D.C. has a lot of circles, very different from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So those are a San Francisco going up and down, those kinds of things. So, yeah, that, that was very helpful and appreciate the you, you breaking those down. I'm, you talked a little bit about how in the past, for example, maybe a parked car opening their door was a novel thing to deal with and, you know, neat required some you know that was the edge case at the time and the edge case of the time now is has increased in complexity by an order of magnitude where it's like a person dressed as an animal holding a cone in a school zone isn't that the case i mean think about it i probably when you started doing podcasts this um thing about uh, street signs and in and, and being as you said stop signs and stuff like that these were things that we oh we'd be labeling them now it's like okay that's the the basic work we do can we even automate some of that 
And then it's going into a lot of it is around predictive and movement tracking of video object tracking. And I will tell you these two things that these reflections are really, um, you have to pay attention. A lot of our edge cases, we've seen that. Another one is um, there's a whole workflow around difference between smoke, exhaust, um, sort of wispy clouds, um, and just things like that. And knowing the differences between these four or five, um, I call them the wispy workflows. That's not what the clients call them, but or, or we call them, but I call them the wispy workflows. And knowing those differences, because think about it, the difference between exhaust smoke and a fire could be um, the difference between a, a somebody taking a very proactive action and kind of like ignoring it, right? And that could be a hugely, a huge impact. So it's even at that level, Gurtej, and that's where this technology and experts in the loop become really important because you have to be trained on these technologies as well. Yeah, I'm really curious on, cause so let's kind of, we, we go back in time and the data challenge now is we need to label a stop sign, a stop sign, or we need to label a street light, a street light. Um, and, and I'm not sure if this is actually how the technology works. So you can maybe uh, share a little bit more and I'd be really fascinated to learn. But my guess is you have some sort of library of items. Like these are all the things that something could be. And then it's almost like, yes, this is that, this is that, this is that. One, is that actually how this works? And then two, when you get to the point where you have these complex person in a costume holding an item, is that now become like multiple tags where you're like, okay, it is, it is a traffic cone and it is a person and it is a person dressed as an animal or something like that. Like, how does this actually work? I mean, is I merit managing this library of information of like what things could be or is that something that the companies are doing i'm actually just not very familiar with how kind of how this whole component would work i'd love to learn a little more about that okay so we we work with some of the largest av companies right the classification so what you talked about this is a human this is a um, you know, a dog, this is a cat. That's what we used to do. There was simple, I would call them simple classifications. There may be 30 classifications. You put banding boxes, polygons around them, and et cetera, and you classified them. That used to be about three years ago. As that has advanced, you start to look. We, one of the key things is we cannot think transactionally anymore, and it's no longer just libraries that exist. This is a, such a dynamic. I mean, we look at the um, what happens with policy changes and instructions and these kinds of classifications. I am serious. They, those changes happen sometimes three to four times a week. So one of the key elements of this, and sometimes those quote classifications can be so nuanced that we have to actually codify and capture in um, L&D platform that we call iMerit1, the complexities and nuances. So it has become, there, there are like four things, consistency. So naming certain things being consistent, this is, a, this is the edge of the road. Well, the edge of the road on the left side and on the right side of the road, depending on which way the vehicle is going, are actually different. What is the, the edge meaning? There could be dirt on one side and there could be actually a proper edge on the other side. And so these things vary. So the nuance becomes extremely important. Um, insight, you would think that, uh, oh, these are label ops and, and annotation people and uh, mapping people and map ops. 
but they bring an insight. Sometimes our team might be at the team lead level, not even at the product technologist or the project manager, may be on with a CTO of one of our top companies, definitely with their product people, sometimes with their engineers and data scientists to say, when I look at this set of things, the images are so, they are rain images, fog images, et cetera. The subjectivity is so large, they are on Slack. And sometimes there could be 10 slacks going back and forth to look at one image, share the image and say, okay, this is the way we should label it. We capture that knowledge and let's call that an edge case knowledge. We capture that in something called the edge case module. And when it happens enough times, you then test it in the next case that it happens and it happens enough time, that becomes a policy. So it's a very nuanced, judgmental, complex stuff. You look at one of those zoomed images that have uh, multi-sensor fusion. I've sat there for 45 minutes to an hour, and I can't for the life of me figure out how this young lady is able to do this complex labeling and because I'm sitting there thinking, I, the, the car is moving, but then this is happening. The LIDAR says this and the camera says it. She says, keep your mind clean, look at each image, and then aggregate them together. Or look at e- each image from its different technology and then aggregate them together. So it, is, it has now become, we've advanced to the point, it's like a joint project between the client and us. And why is this not a library? Let me address that as well. The algorithms are different. The technologies in the cars are different from one large AV client to another. They may go into multiple cars, but the the technologies between the large AV players is different. The data science is different. Because of that, the relationship of the algorithms to the label ops, to the mappers, to the map ops, or the fleet maps to the map ops becomes a, comes together. And so you can't just, first of all, we wouldn't because of the confidentiality between clients, our teams, we could have 800 people working with one of these large AV clients, 800 to 1,000 people, they are completely separate from another five, 800 people working at another AV client. But it's also the libraries are different, as you call them libraries, and not even libraries, they're actually policies and, um, and instructions that go into each workflow. There is a client on whom we are working simultaneously on 14 workflows. 14. I mean, we don't we even think that that's like a company in itself that we're doing. So these all become very interactive, very much uh, dynamic, changing. And it is only going to get more dynamic Kurtaj, as we go into launch cities and into the map up space, because think about it, right? That's actually during deployment. I will end with one last thing. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of going through all this and you can stop and ask me questions. But think of it as these five steps. I talked about the label ops, which trains the algorithms. I talked about the map ops, which is doing the building of the maps in production maps, and then live updates of the maps. Then there is audit, post-analysis, and validation. So a person who does this work, Why is this called an expert workforce? Why is this not out in the crowd? A person who does this work can become a domain expert over a three-year period. And we have many people, I would say at least a thousand people, but now probably more like 2000 people who have become experts. They've been through label ops, they're in map ops, they're starting to do not just QA, but auditing and validation. Validation hasn't started, which is validating that the algorithms and the map ops all come together and that they are working. So, and taking dynamic data back and doing live updates and things. 
So that is the complexity. It's the technologies. It's also, I think, the excitement of this. Thank you for sharing that. That was that was very helpful in how I conceptualize how the data is structured and with the working relationship between uh, iMerit and the you know your AV partners that you're working with. When I think about the each of these companies having their complete own data science policy structure and everything, it always blows my mind that so much work is being done in parallel between all these companies. I understand why it's being done in parallel, but it is it is a, a bit uh, mind boggling still to me. With that, you mentioned that you know now as the as the complexity of the uh, data demands have increased. Uh, significantly over the last two, three years. Um, And you mentioned that we're probably in that kind of last mile, second to last mile phase. It feels like with AI in particular and AVs specifically, that last mile can be the the whole game (laughs) in in some way. But uh, I'm really curious on on your thoughts. I mean, what, what do you think kind of takes us from from here through that that last mile that maybe that last two miles what's the the remaining data that needs to to be understood and and you know the technology cannot deal with it like from your vantage point of having so much uh experience with this like where do you what do you think separates us from where we are today to okay cool we've hit that last mile now let's work on getting these vehicles out on the roads and our autonomous drivers tests and all, and all of those you know sorts of fun things. First of all, the last mile is probably going to be, we are in the first, first few steps of the last mile. Let's think of it that way. We are so early in the last mile. And I think we would, I said it, but we should be careful to not think of it as the last mile because we're just starting, remember, to launch pilots. It's in launch mode. To launch pilots might be into a total of, I think there are launch pilots of AV, the top AV companies. I don't know, I'm thinking about the thing. We're probably in 22 cities or 20 cities, something like that. There are not that many, and they're in pilot mode lot of data coming back. So when I think about this, I think of it as like pre-production. That's what launches. So it's those first steps of what does it even look like when you get one of these autonomous vehicles into the uh, uh, into streets. Now, an important part of this um, getting to success is the ability to navigate once the basic algorithms are working well. Let's just say, it's, we aren't even there yet, but let's just say the basic algorithms are working well. Now we have to navigate in the physical environment. And this is where three very important things come into place. Edge cases. And what are those? Are those like 2%, 5%? No, they can be as much as 30% of edge cases. And you're mapping them, you're getting them across uh, different vehicles being in different cities, not just from a map ops, but also from a label ops point of view. As I said earlier, real-time data feedback, traffic pattern analysis, complex road transitions. Oh my gosh. You go into one of those circles, um, you know, those circles in Washington, D.C., it's like so complex. You could be stuck on a circle like that doing mapping operations for, for a month and two months, three months. And so those kinds of things, you think of it as key to conquering the edge in AV. So that is, I think, becomes very important. Uh, vehicles reading the road conditions which are changing to determine the pr- proper path and decisions. So this becomes a highly sophisticated set of algorithms with many different sensors, literally mapping the city. The other important thing which you started to allude to 
is how do we get cities to assess and measure sharing data? In a way, Gurtaj, if you look at map ops, the when you build the production maps, other than the fact that you have to build them in a way to relate them to the algorithms and the approach that an a particular AV maker has, otherwise the build maps should be shareable, right? They are not shareable entirely, but at least you should be able to have some transference of the um, the kinds of um, uh, assessment and measurement of sharing. And I wouldn't even say sharing of data, but of the assessments and the metrics. And what are the changes? One of the things we talked about on uh, when I was with this um, Las Vegas um, CIO is the fact that they would give ahead of time public works changes, sporting events, et cetera, and they would be built into the live map. So sharing becomes, I think, in the future, and I don't know what my clients would say about this, but I think that that is what will increase safety accessibility and efficiencies in cities by a factor of multiples is proactive access to the data that's changing and having that access by autonomous vehicles in a broad way. So think of a city with a number of use cases of autonomous vehicles. They don't all have to be self-driving cars. They could be, and it could be all different kinds of autonomous technologies as I was telling you about driver distraction to radar, to LIDAR, to, uh, to be able to do self-driving cars, to delivery vehicles, to robotic, robot taxis, to et cetera, then I think that to increase safety, accessibility, and efficiencies in cities, that is where we have to go if I look forward 10 years from now. Absolutely. And I like the way that you framed that as being the first few steps of the last mile. Um, and it, it makes sense that, you know, you mentioned those those kind of roundabout circles in Washington, D.C. will be the last one kind of like a, for those types of situations, the, that level of complexity of situation will be the, the last to 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 reach the the level of maturity needed to to move forward with with the next steps. and. I'd love to to kind of just round out the you you mentioned it too kind of over the next like let's say five to ten years let's say like once we've taken more steps along the the last mile and now we have resolved more and more of the um date let's call it the the core data the core operational challenges is there any any other kind of big challenges or opportunities that you see that still need to be addressed in order for you know, autonomous technologies, autonomous vehicles in particular, to to really hit that kind of mainstream societal adoption uh, in a way that you know the like you know the sci-fi of the past has shown. Where you, okay, yeah, you have this, you know, this just comes pick you up and and you and you move about. Um, you you alluded to the uh, the cities. You alluded to data sharing between cities and perhaps between companies. Anything else that comes to mind in terms of challenges or opportunities, given your your vantage point? I think once we start to get enough autonomous technologies on the road, which will, you know, which is over the next three years, five years, whatever, and they are in all these different examples I gave, right? And it could be in robot taxis, it could be in this, it could be in that, it has driver distraction, it has self-driving cars, all of that happens in the autonomous vehicles. I think a lot of focused, now I'm going to call it autonomous mobility, will have to enable autonomous mobility to increase safety, accessibility, and efficiencies in cities by a factor of multiples, not just it's easier to do, it's not just accessible to elite people. It is safety, accessibility, and efficiency. And I know that those aren't the most sexy technologies in the world. 
But that is the end focus of autonomous mobility. What does that mean in terms of what we need to do? So the challenges and opportunities, I think that still need to be addressed to further ad advance autonomous mobility. And I will look at it in cities across the US because that's what I'm most familiar with, um, because they're not so much out there. First of all, I think it's going to be very much sharing data between AB ecosystem. That includes large auto automotive companies, the autonomous vehicle technology companies, and local government. Going to be very important. How do you make that work? Relying on human driver intervention. How do these come together? And that brings up things like speech to text, you know, the, the vehicle and the, the human driver could be sitting at the back, but the human driver intervention and the, and the back and forth with the vehicle. Think about what kinds of technologies we'll need in speech to text and in natural language processing and things like that. Navigating regulations and policies of local, state, and federal. I think this is going to be, every city is different. We're working in probably like, as I said, somewhere, I think between 20 and 25 cities. That's a lot of people. We have 2,500 people in autonomous uh, vehicle sort of work in many different stages, as I talked about it in the whole life cycle. Environmental improvements, ecosystem of data across stakeholders to improve, to gain demographic insight. And that is very important when you start to use them as robot taxis or being able to do mass transportation, safety protocol to deploy at scale. I actually think this will lead towards, and this is more thinking about it as a vision, creating highly efficient cities where they are constantly adapting and optimizing based on these factors and the environmental factors, uh, the uh, regulations, policies, safety protocol, and these cities then, which many people call smart cities, would be working very closely with the autonomous uh, mobility technology and vehicle manufacturers and deployers. And I think it is that which is, if you think about it, that is not, we have, we have fantastic technology companies. We have fantastic car companies. We have fantastic shuttle companies, drones and all that. We have very well-run cities, but think about these coming together because that's how traffic patterns, events, uh, roadworks, all of these will come together, drone deliveries, and it is that ecosystem. We don't have policies, procedures, the, even the framework of working together, and they have to flow seamlessly to make autonomous mobility work. And then you link them with the consumer somebody has in their own thing. One picture, last picture for you. Let's think about it five years from now, 10 years from now. You and I are, and I'll pick Las Vegas again, you know, one of us is into, in events in Las Vegas. And that's on our, on our calendar. Are we going to a meeting in, in, you know, Venetian or something? And so here shows up an autonomous vehicle, takes us there, knows how long the meeting is. So now you're getting into consumer robot. Knows how long the meeting is, when they have to come back. And when your meeting gets, you know, like it's only half the time, then what are the steps you take to summon that vehicle? It comes back, it knows where you have to go to next, it knows the traffic patterns to take, it knows it's a sporting event, it's at gate number A3, because that's the ticket you have. Just think about that picture, right? And at the same time, it's not just in a place like Las Vegas. You take it into a broader farmland areas and what is needed with a very important part of autonomous mobility is for precision agriculture, geospatial images. We work with precision agriculture companies and looking at farm equipment everywhere and their deployment. So this goes into really redefining the way mobility happens. 
And I will stop at that because now I'm kind of getting into the future, far into the future, maybe not so far. We work on many things that we used to think were far, far away three years ago, and they're happening now. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that's and that's where the future starts, right? Is from from these conversations and from these ideas of what it is. So I really appreciate you you sharing that, uh, and it's it's got my gears turning a lot, especially on that data ecosystem. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about, kind of over the the past few years. And I am mm. not not really sure on my end. I mean, is this like a a private entity who takes over? Um, building out the the plumbing of this This is a government entity that uh, runs this through kind of regulation or or a policy angle. Really curious, kind of see how that plays out in in the future. But but yeah, I totally agree that that's a a very necessary component. And you know, one thing that's happening that um, um, many, some of the cities uh, have some really smart chief data officers, technology officers, CIOs, CIOs now become like the chief smart officer for smart city. You know, I, I joke with them about it saying, oh, and they're, the, they're a data officer. And that is, that's important for the technology companies and the, um, the autonomous vehicle companies um, to really start to embrace that ecosystem. And we need frameworks of operation. We need the it's like it's like an architecture and data flows. I mean, you know, you've done civil engineering, I've done electrical or electronics and computers and stuff, and you're doing your architecture, the architecture of a smart city. What are the data flows in a smart city? Now, the only difference is it's autonomous. How do you bring all these things together, right? So that's uh, that, I think, is the exciting part coming up. Well, right now, remember, we're in the first steps. Of the last month. Mm-hmm. So remember that. <laughs> yeah, we always gotta remember that, even though we yeah. wanna we wanna run through to the end. One of the the questions that I've had for, for some time now is around um, you know, as as let's say we 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 kind of final you know finalize the last mile and we move forward and now we have uh like like you've alluded to these different sets of challenges uh to address things like the the data ecosystems, there's going to be also like other policy uh, issues, there's going to be, who knows what what arises from this, right? It's an, another revolution. Mm-hmm. And there's there's going to be industries and markets and, and many, many things that that come out of this. Um, when you think about the workforce, I know that that, you know, building a, a very diverse workforce has been a focus of iMerit over the last uh, eight years. And when you think about the the workforce, and what needs to evolve over the next, let's call it, you know, decade or so of this maturity of AI and bringing these technologies to market? I mean, how do you think about that? I think about it, um, first of all, as inclusive workforce. Um, I actually think diverse is diverse. Inclusive brings it together. Inclusive sort of, that. that's my view of things. And, you know, people might... I know the industry uses diverse, but to me, the inclusion is what makes it possible for these technologies to be ubiquitous. I mean, I think the autonomous mobility revolution is going to, in itself, going to create and have a lot of different kinds of workforces everywhere from, you know, the kind of workforce we have to the government to, uh, to uh, you know, different aspects of the autonomous, uh, as autonomous actually goes into production and starts to get deployed and things. There are going to be GIS people that are needed for autonomous mobility. Um, There are people who are literally, I mean, one of the things that we talked about was, imagine this, right? People in the public works and or doing monitoring sports events and stuff, and they have a little map and then they are able to actually use AI to be able to uh, automatically, uh, autonomously direct vehicles places or to look at how things can be, what the signs would look like that um, are in some ways the signs for, uh, this is a sporting event that has this kind of uh, flow of traffic might have a new set of signs. 
and they are using their they're using their pads to be able to direct things. So there's all kinds of jobs that can happen even within on streets in in different ways. But I think that the having different kinds of inputs, voices, views, biases, because a lot of bias brings in uniformity, right? When you get lots of inputs, then you train the algorithms and you that becomes even more, uh, it's more representative. And I think all of this is going to be in, we're going to have to define and look at a whole new class of jobs in the millions as autonomous mobility starts to get into the real world environment. And that's that's where I think we feel pretty strongly. We have a micro, small microcosm of it. We feel that the inclusivity is going to be very important. Um, people ask me, you know, I'll just end with one thing. Um, people ask me, well, how can you have a tech company, an AI data company with 50% women? And I always, my answer is, have you seen the world? It's kind of 50-50. If the world can be 50-50, the physical environment, then our tech environment and organizational environment, um, especially in autonomous mobility, can easily be 50-50. So it's not a surprise that it's a 50-50. It would be a surprise if it were not, if you wanted to make this ubiquitous. So that's, that's kind of my philosophical view of things. I love it and especially love the the focus on uh, using the word kind of inclusive rather than than diverse. Uh, I um, I'm going to start using that personally. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, well, well, thank you, Radha, for taking your time out of your busy, very busy schedule to share your, your vast knowledge of the space with me and the audience. For those who want to you know, find out more about you or I merit, where can they find you? Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this because it was, um, you know, you asked some, you asked some very uh, incisive questions, and you know the space. And also, I think it was, um, it was comfortable to talk about. It was like a conversation. So thank you for that. You can find us at www.imerit.net on our website, on LinkedIn, on several social media platforms, particularly a lot of LinkedIn. And there's a lot of material. And uh, for example, I talked about edge cases, but now I, and our different um, blogs and articles, white papers that are on the website, uh, interviews as well. So um, yeah, come, come visit us. We would love to talk to you. Perfect. So you can find it at imerit.net. And, and thanks again, Radha. It was a very interesting interview. Thank you. Good pitch. If you enjoyed this episode, it'd mean a lot if you could leave a rating and review to help others find the podcast. If you'd like to connect or have any suggestions for future episodes, you can reach me on LinkedIn or send me an email at g at autonomousvehiclespodcast.com. Thanks. And until next time.